Thank you so much for coming to the session, Speeding Up Research in Genomics. My name is Jonathan Sheffy. I'm the product manager at Google Cloud uh, for biomedical data, including genomics, gene expression, and, and so on. Um, so, uh, really excited about our panelists here today. We've got panelists from uh, Duke, Michigan, and Stanford. Uh, and before we get to their talks, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the team that I'm a part of, a couple of important announcements in case you missed them yesterday, and tell you a little bit about what my team is working on. So I'm part of a team called the Cloud for Healthcare and Life Sciences team. We are a set of product managers, engineers, solution architects, and go-to-market uh, that are focused on how we can help in healthcare and life sciences build things into Google Cloud that our industry will find uh, useful and uh, increase the scale of their work. Within the product team, we're focused on not just genomic data, not just biomedical data, but everything. How do we help make medical imaging data more useful through, uh, for example, our DICOM API, which helps you structure uh, imaging metadata in BigQuery, um, or our, our clinical uh, team, which focuses, you may have heard this week that our healthcare API launched to Alpha helping provider systems more effectively manage their clinical data. Um, and one of the things that's really exciting about this kind of work is what it enables us to unlock when more and more data is coming to the cloud. The other announcement you may have heard about in Diane Green's keynote yesterday morning um, was our new partnership with the National Institutes of Health. Um, under this really groundbreaking partnership, um, we will be making many of the high value public and controlled access data sets uh, from the, that are funded by the NIH available to users of Google Cloud. Um, so this will include many of the data sets that you're already working with um, and now will no longer need to worry about needing to find space in your data center for. Uh, actually, kind of story about this, uh, a few years ago I was sitting at a research university that will remain nameless. And in the meeting, there were three PIs at one end of the table, and there was a head of research computing at the other end of the table. And over the course of the discussions, we were learning about the work that they were doing. It turned out that each of the PIs had separately downloaded their own copy of 1,000 Genomes. I see some smiles of recognition. <laughs> this may have happened to you. You may have seen this happen. And if I looked at the other end of the table, I saw a research computing director whose face was basically melting, realizing at how much data was being uh, duplicated and stored in their uh, data center. And so these are some of the problems that we're trying to solve, both by democratizing access to data for researchers, but also solving some of these uh, operational excellence problems for, for research IT leaders um, at universities and other folks doing biomedical research. And it also sets us up to build some really fantastic product. So I'm going to tell you about, for example, one of the products from my own team. Um, one of the things we've built is called Variant Transforms. It's an open source tool. You can find it on GitHub. Not only is the code online, not only the docs online, but our roadmap is online. So please feel free to vote on the issues. Uh, and what Variant Transforms does, it's a tool that lets you take your VCF data, your processed genome data, and import it directly into BigQuery. BigQuery is an incredible tool. A managed data warehouse solution, somebody, uh, one of my colleagues mentioned, I think it stores 13 copies of the web every day. So it's an incredible data warehouse, and we're setting it up so that you can use BigQuery to manage your variant data. So what does this mean in practice? I want to tell you about uh, a company called Color Genomics. They're actually right here in the Bay Area. Uh, they're a health services company. They provide affordable genetic testing focused in breast cancer. You may have heard of them. So they've got this 30 gene panel in, in cancer. And uh, they also had, separately, an existing database of uh, you know, phenotypic data, health information data, and so on, about all these samples that have come through their lab. And you know, they've got the VCF data, they've got this, this uh, Postgres database of, of phenotypic information. I said, what can we do here? You know, if there's a genotype to phenotype problem, we could probably investigate. And um, they looked at existing cloud providers that will remain nameless, that are not Google Cloud, and they found they really didn't have the data warehouse solution that they were looking for to be able to handle this kind of a problem. And so they used Variant Transforms, this tool that I, that I mentioned. They were able to import all of that genomic data directly into BigQuery. They were able to import the, they used the BigQuery import tool to bring in all of the phenotypic data. And their data scientists were able to stand up a set of machine learning tools on top of that um, integrated, joined data set. 
So what happened? They were able to do all the feature engineering in one week, actually during their quarterly company hack week, where they get to work on whatever they want. And they were able to create models that dramatically outperformed uh, an existing clinical model. They were actually able to show that this 30 gene cancer panel was able to predict a biomarker not in cancer, which is a publishable result, pretty exciting, and possibly a product opportunity for the company. More importantly, it really transformed them from thinking about themselves as a lab company that just, you know, makes VCFs, much like maybe the informatics cores at your own institutions, uh, and think about themselves more as a data organization where they're really doing data mining, and that's because of Google Cloud. All right, you didn't come to just listen to me. I want to introduce our fantastic panelists. So uh, we'll be hearing from uh, Alex Waldrop and Razvan Penea from Duke University, and then Jonathan Lefebvre from the University of Michigan, and finally, Salmi Utira Miror, I think I got that right, uh, from uh, Stanford University. I'm so excited to hear what they've got to share with us. And uh, to lead us off, Alex and Razvan. Thank you, Jonathan, for that introduction. Um, today, I want to talk to you all a little bit about what our lab is doing and scaling up to the challenge of cancer genomics with Google Cloud and a software package that we've created called Cloud Conductor. I want to tell you something about the state of cancer research that you may not know, right, is that although we've made tremendous progress in the past 50 years on understanding how cancers arise and how to treat them, we've only scratched the surface in understanding the true diversity of the, the known cancer types that are in existence. So for instance, the World Health Organization identified, or it currently recognizes over 1,000 cancer types. We have good data on maybe 200 of those. So the next decades, we'll be filling in those knowledge gaps. And part of that is with cancer genomics. And the state of cancer genomics actually lags even further behind. So take, for example, the Cancer Genome Atlas, TCGA, which Jonathan just mentioned. But in that original study, it took them eight years they, took, they, they, they sequenced 10,000 tumors, but just from 13 different cancer types, right? So we have good sequence data and genomic data on less than 1% of the known cancers. So our lab, before you know, our lab's goal is simple, and that is to systematically study the genomics of all cancers. Now, before you laugh so hard that you fall out of your chair, I want, to make some, I, want to, I want to say a claim that's going to be even more audacious, and that is our goal is to do that within the next five years. Now, we're making progress towards that, right? So this past year, in a pilot study that we did published in Cell, we looked at 1,000 tumors from a single lymphoma subtype called DLBCL. But eventually, that goal is to scale up to 100,000 tumors sequenced from each of those 1,000 cancers represented. How are we making strides on that? Well, first off, we did the hard work and we founded a worldwide consortium of over 30 leading academic hospitals from around the world. So these are helping us gather patients, uh, enroll them in the studies so that we can have the diversity of cancer types rec uh, represented in that data set. We've also created a collaborative cloud-based system for collating, collecting that metadata and those tumors um, so we can store things like pathology data and pathology reviews. Eventually, we'll be able to link up that metadata with the genomic data and understand how patient outcomes are being influenced by patient genotypes. But the more um, kind of the, the, the more tangible goal that we'll be reaching this year is sequencing 10,000 blood cancers from over 100 different lymphoma subtypes. Now, why blood cancers? For one, they're the number one in terms of cancer diagnosis and treatment across cancers. For two, with over 100 types, they're extremely diverse uh, and basically will be knocking out about 10% of our goal of all, blood, of all cancers by just sequencing uh, this one category. So we've already enrolled more than 10,000 patients in the study and have collected more than 10,000 tumor samples and we've already begun exome and, whole tr and transcriptome sequencing on this project. But a bigger question is, how can a group of four bioinformaticians do in four months what it took TCGA and their hundreds of bioinformaticians almost eight years to do, and that is to sequence 10,000 genomes uh, at the same time? And maybe to understand how we're saving time, 
it's, it would be a, a better lesson to talk about why it is so time consuming to sequence a genome in order to make those kind of breakthroughs. So it would be really great if a DNA sequencer was a machine that picked up a genome and lets you read it into in like a book. Uh, that actually doesn't exist. Uh, in practice, a DNA sequencer is a little bit more like a shredder in that you put the book into and it rips it into a billion pieces that you get back and have to assemble later. Um, so in order to read that story uh, from that bag of a billion pieces, uh, and, and by reading the story in our case, it is you know, identifying a variant that may be underlying a cancer. Um, but in, in any case, uh, the, the process of assembling a bag of a billion slices of paper back into an original book or reassembling a genome uh, is very computationally comp uh, ex expensive and operationally complex. It usually involves 15 or 20 third-party tools being strung together in what we call a biological pipeline. And this is basically where you're piping the output from one program into the output of another. They have different versions. Each of them has their own runtime environment. It's a real pain in the butt to try to get these things going. Uh, and so from a, a computing perspective, the ad hoc approaches that people generally use are not reproducible. They are time consuming and they're very error prone. And so that's why we uh, are using and created Cloud Conductor to help uh, solve those challenges and on our way to the 10,000 uh, and even the 100,000 genomes goal. And to talk about how Cloud Conductor is doing that, um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Razvan Panea here. Thank you, Alex. Cloud Conductor is a cloud-based bioinformatics workflow management system. We developed Cloud Conductor to address the four central challenges in biocomputing. The first challenge in biocomputing is diversity, as many analysis pipelines in research use different bioinformatics tools in different orders, so implementing the system that allows the researcher to run any pipeline. Secondly, Scalability is a problem in bioinformatics as the input sample size is continuously increasing and the institutional re computing resources are limited. Fortunately, cloud computing platforms such as Google Cloud are actually a solution to this problem. Furthermore, the total cost of processing is also a problem. However, we managed to fix this issue by using preemptible instances from Google Cloud. And finally, portability is actually a very serious problem as data analysis needs to be reproducible. However, we're using Docker technology to containerize the tools in the pipelines so the researcher can run the same pipeline anywhere without having to worry about affecting the final output. After solving these challenges, Cloud Conductor has become a comprehensive workflow management system that works in three big phases. The first phase is represented by the researcher selecting from a list of predefined and user-defined bioinformatics tools to generate an analysis workflow, after which Cloud Conductor validates and interprets this workflow. In the next phase, Cloud Conductor obtains these tools and runs them in the correct order by used, allocating the necessary resources on a cloud computing platform, such as Google Cloud, and by generating a processing environment using the Docker system. After the analysis is complete, Cloud Conductor could transfer the analysis statistics to a database and the final output to an actual cloud uh, storage system, such as Google Cloud Storage. Now, in order to, in our, for our now lab to use the Cloud Conductor, we implement an additional infrastructure layer that fully automates this entire system. The system starts from the moment the sequencing data enters our lab. At the click of one single button, we update the database, our lab database, with the new sequencing information. And almost immediately after that, Cloud Conductor Daemon, a service that we implemented that waits and continuously waits and watches the database, identifies the new addition and generates a new instance of Cloud Conductor on Google Cloud Platform. And after a short period of time, when the, after the analysis is complete, Cloud Conductor reports the status of the analysis to the lab database, and the final output files that we'll look later 
are transferred to Google Cloud Storage. And as you can observe, overall, the system is not only fully automa uh, automated, but it can also be reproducible. And as a proof of concept, where we used an early version of this pipeline of this system to process a large cohort of 1,000 lymphoma patients that was published in Cell. And in the future, we're planning to use this system to s increase the sample size not only by 10 times, but even 100 times. Before I close, I would like to acknowledge our lab, Tushar Dave, a co-developer of Cloud Conductor. And in conclusion, Cloud Conductor is helping our lab create the largest cancer data sets in the world. Using the right tools, cloud computing helps small labs like ours do data analysis at a high institutional scale level. And using all these systems, we're able to get faster breakthroughs, develop better treatments, and get closer and closer to curing the disease that we study. We'll take questions. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Jonathan Lafave from University of Michigan. Uh, thank you, and good morning, everyone. I suspect most of you have heard of the term precision medicine. The idea is to provide uh, medical treatments and screenings that are tailored to an individual's unique characteristics. Take high cholesterol, for example. LDL cholesterol, which is often referred to as bad cholesterol, can build up in your arteries, resulting in heart disease. The usual cause of this is unhealthy lifestyle choices pertaining to diet and exercise but sometimes this can be inherited. One gene responsible for this is called PCSK9. This gene produces a troublesome enzyme of the same name. This enzyme binds to naturally occurring LDL receptors, preventing these receptors from removing the bad cholesterol. After discovering this, PCSK9 inhibitors were developed. These are drugs that neutralize the enzyme's effect on cholesterol levels. But this treatment won't be equally effective for everyone. Rare mutations in this gene can either make it overactive or knock out its activity altogether. But by looking at a patient's DNA, it's possible for doctors to determine whether or not these inhibitors would be the most effective treatment for their patient. This is a, an example of a genetic effect that we do know about, but there's still plenty to be learned before precision medicine can reach its full potential. The National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute is sponsoring a project called TopMed that is focused on closing this knowledge gap. But for project like, projects like this to study DNA, they must first collect DNA. A traditional method for this is using what's called a microarray. It targets small subsets of the genome, supplying researchers with tens to hundreds of thousands of genetic markers to analyze. This technique is relatively inexpensive, which makes it attractive for use in both research and consumer services like 23andMe and Ancestry.com. And while this method is useful for targeting common variations in DNA, it lacks the scope needed to uh, find rare associations uh, like those in PCSK9. For this, we need to use a method called whole genome sequencing, which looks at the entire genome. With this process, a lab physically sequences short, accurate reads of DNA. These reads are then algorithmically aligned or mapped to a reference genome and include a lot of overlap or depth to ensure that what we're seeing in the data isn't due to random error. The Top Med Initiative is employing this technique with 130,000 individuals and has produced data sets up to 600 million variants. In other words, 600 million potential avenues for discovery. 40% of these are extremely rare and have likely never been seen before. Only with this level of information can we study how rare mutations are associated with disease. Now, at this point, some of you may be thinking, well, that's great, but what does this have to do with Google Cloud? 
So going forward, I'm gonna talk about the technical challenges of whole genome sequencing, how and why we leverage Google Cloud Platform to surmount these challenges, and how the cloud is helping us foster collaboration in research. So here's how whole genome sequencing breaks down in terms of data size and compute. At the scale of TopMed, it produces approximately three petabytes of highly compressed sequence data. And mapping these reads takes around 6,000 core years of compute. That is a long time to wait, and we haven't even gotten to the science yet. At the University of Michigan, we are warehousing, mapping, and generating aggregate data sets of TopMed data so that the genomes can be used in association analyses. Using our local cluster, which has a few thousand cores, it would take years to tackle this amount of sequence data. But with the seemingly limitless resources on Google Compute Engine, we can compress a couple years of data prep into a few months. This means researchers can start analyzing the data and making discoveries much sooner. This convenience does come at a cost, and researchers tend to have limited budgets. But there are a couple features which go beyond simply having competitive prices that make Google Cloud Platform stand out in this, in this regard. Unlike other cloud providers that restrict users to predefined machine types, Compute Engine is completely modular, allowing resource allocations that meet the exact needs of a given task. These fine-tuned controls allow those of us with limited budgets maximize every penny. Preemptible machines can take those cost savings even further. As many of you already know, GCP offers their idle resource reserves at a fraction of the cost, but with a caveat that they can be preempted or taken away at any moment. In order to reduce the time lost from preemption, we have altered our pipelines to be more resilient. We've done this by chunking our compute jobs into smaller pieces and checkpointing the output files into cloud storage. With this approach, we can still make progress even when preemption occurs. Cloud storage is also be serving another purpose. TopMed is a collaboration of approximately 30 studies across many institutions. Each study has focused expertise in diseases such as uh, asthma, sickle cell disease, uh, atrial fibrillation, and heart disease. Making these discoveries requires a diverse knowledge base, so genomic data sets like these have traditionally been distributed to the experts to be analyzed on our local clusters. But this is becoming more and more difficult to handle as data sizes increase, especially for smaller labs. The National Institute of Health is piloting an ecosystem using TopMed data following a different approach. Instead of sending data to the scientist, we are bringing the scientists to the data. It's called an NIH Data Commons, and it will empower researchers from institutions of all sizes to perform high-throughput computations within Google's platform. But even within the space, data access needs to be regulated. When DNA is donated, it is often given with specific consent that determine what it can be used for. And these consents vary widely from study to study. The Data Commons is building frameworks for access control on top of the existing cloud storage APIs. And we're doing this to ensure that these consents are respected. These frameworks range from programmatically generating signed URLs to fused file system limitations that turn buckets into a mounted disk. Google Cloud's container support is another great feature uh, for this type of environment. Scientists love containers, and it's not just because it's easy to deploy complicated pipelines, but because it makes it easier for peers to reproduce your work, and reproducibility is critical in science. Google's private container repos are backed by cloud storage. This allows for bloated container, container images to be pulled more quickly, and just like typical objects in cloud storage, Access controls can be applied, allowing you to safely share images that contain sensitive health or genetic information. So by leveraging the cloud in these ways, we can scale to unprecedented levels of data storage and compute, allowing us to make discoveries more quickly. We can bring researchers together to work on a level playing field and in a highly collaborative environment. And in doing so, we can quicken the pace of medical progress. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, up next, we have uh, the Director of Bioinformatics at Stanford University, uh, Saomi uh, Yuramira. Thanks, Jonathan. Good morning, everyone. I am Saomi. As any true academic would do, I've collected multiple titles, which I will not bore you with today. Uh, but in essence, my role is to drive adoption of genomics in medicine. Jonathan already mentioned about precision medicine. So what is precision medicine? Since I made pretty slides with light bulbs, I'm going to reiterate the point. Um, we take genomic sequencing data uh, of the patient. We combine with sequencing data from other patients with similar disease or disorders, even healthy individuals for that matter. We analyze them together with all available annotations or publicly available annotations to come up with a precise diagnosis for that patient. And finally, we tailor the treatment not just based on the disease, but to the particular genetic makeup of the patient that is concerned. So in essence, we are trying to be Starbucks for medicine. So at Stanford, our vision is to deliver on the promise of precision medicine for all our patients, and we do so by using genomic sequencing. Primarily, we are focused on childhood uh, rare diseases, inherited cancer, cardio, and uh, neurological disorders. So that's the promise of precision medicine, but what are the challenges, right? So there are several challenges, principal among which is that we have yet to understand the regulatory mechanisms of many of the genes and how their functions correlate at a more at a pathways level, right? But there are more mundane or fundamental challenges which are yet to overcome, and principal among which is, as Jonathan mentioned, repeatability and reproducibility, which is paramount when you're using anything in a diagnostic setting, right? So if you are diabetic, you're taking a blood test to measure sugar levels. If the instrument gives two widely different measurements at different times uh, you make measurement, you're not going to rely on that. Genetic tests are extremely complex, primarily because we use multiple instruments, hundreds of different analytical methods which runs on different hardware platforms, whether it be laptop, in-house cluster, or on the cloud. But yet, we are expected to reproduce the same result, not just on a given day, but up to two years into the future. So, and the second biggest point, as that everybody and the other panelists mentioned, is security. Anybody has done anything on the cloud is primarily worried about data security, and this is extremely important when you put patient health information on the cloud. This essentially gives people fits and makes us lose sleep every night. But how do we overcome these challenges? Primarily with the help of container-optimized engine, uh, virtual machines from Google, and HIPAA comp compatibility and certification of all GCP components helps us achieve this goal much more easily and removes the heavy lift of maintaining these hardware from small clinical labs like us, which essentially we are not experts in. So here is the example of how we have solved it in Stanford. Uh, you already ha heard about Docker, which is essentially crucial for reproducibility. We have our own workflow manager. Of course, we have to have our own, uh, right? We cannot just use others. <laughs> so we, ours is called Loom, which essentially pulls in, the, understands uh, workflow language, pulls in the Docker container that you need for execution a step, imports all the files that is needed, hashes them to make sure that the files have not changed. If so, it wants that the uh, workflow is not reproducible. At the end of the execution, shuts down the VM and copies the, all the files back to the specified storage. This way, we can ship off the container and the workflow language to any institution and they can reproduce the results. But let's get to a bigger problem. And the bigger problem is that any genetic test, uh, the average diagnostic yield is around 30%. Of course, for certain diseases, it's much higher than 30, and for certain, this is lower. But what do we mean by that? Like, you know, if for all the patients that walk in with a genetic disorder into our lab, we are able to give a precise diagnosis only for, on average, 30% of the cases, right? Which we have to improve upon. So I'll give you two specific patient study examples in the next couple of slides to highlight the importance of adopting novel sequencing methods, analytical methods, and data mining and data sharing in order to be able to improve upon the said diagnostic yield. 
So the first is example is a patient case with carny complex, uh, with cardiac myxoma, which is essentially carny complex leads to benign tumors in different tissue types, primarily skin, but when it gets to heart, it leads to weakening of our valves and ultimately requiring a heart transplant. So this is a patient case. We had a suspicion that we, this is a genetic disorder. We know the gene that causes this, but we sequenced it. We could not find the change that was causal in this patient. So in addition to Illumina short read sequencing, which, which we typically do for all patients, we used a new technology called long read sequencing from PacBio, which led us to identify a long deletion, two exon deletion in this gene, which is deleted in one copy of the gene versus the other, which makes it much more harder to find with short read sequencing. And we had to develop novel sequencing methods in order to be able to analyze this data. This is where the contribution of Google AI and Google Genomics, like uh, Deep Variant from Mark DePristo, is very critical for us to be able to advance this process of being able to identify novel genetic variants, which we are not able to do otherwise. Right? And the second example highlights the importance of data sharing and data mining. Right? This is a case of two siblings affected with several neurological uh, phenotypes, primarily delayed uh, intellectual development, uh, cerebral ataxia, which is essentially you lose control of your muscles, atrophy of the brain itself. So we sequenced uh, this patient. Uh, we found, in this case, we found a mutation in the SNX14 gene but which was involved or implicated in brain development in mouse models, but we had not seen this in any other patient, so we weren't sure whether it's the real causal mutation or not. But purely by chance, we identified another patient in the sidelines of a conference like this, that another patient who had the same symptoms and the same mutation in that gene, which led us to conclude that this is the true causal variant in this uh, gene for this patient, which ended a 10-year diagnostic odyssey for these patients. In most of these cases, these are not, they're curable, but just finding the cause of the disease is so much help for these patients that, that there's a hope, at least, that there is a cure for them in the future, right? So the importance of this data mining or data sharing is really important because these are rare diseases where only a handful of people and handful of mutations are found in genes like this. So finally, I would like to conclude by raising the importance of uh, platforms like Google Cloud and uh, other uh, things, even though it's not in their core business, right? Like, you know, the contributions made by Google AI and Google Genomics helps drive genomics in research much forward and being able to adapt this in precision medicine a whole lot faster. With that, uh, I'd like to thank uh, everyone and invite Jonathan back for Q&A. Thanks so much. All right. All right. Thank you all.